one of the biggest points of stress, especially for fitness fanatics, is the following. I've been working out for a while, but now I need to work out less due to unforeseen circumstances, maybe family life, maybe job, whatever. But the fear is, or the stress is, am I gonna lose my gains? How do I do this, but keep all the gains I got during those years of training? So in today's episode, we're gonna talk about the ways you can keep your gains while working out less. And believe it or not, sometimes you get more gains. Never go longer than two hours without eating. <laughs> no, that's, that's Remember not, when you said, that oh, was yeah. it. Like that was it for in. me right there. I really believe that if I wasn't eating every two hours, the muscle was falling off my body oh, for sure. That's so terrible. Okay. <laughs> God, that's two hours, too, the number <laughs> that they gave us. It, it was. Like, it was like that. I had like alarms and everything I, I set know, off. Dude. <laughs> it's so crappy. No, that's not true. That's not one of them. But, you know, um, I think it's important to know, and the data is pretty good on this, actually pretty clear, that there's a certain amount of volume and intensity and frequency that's required to get your body to progress. Um, and of course, that's different from person to person. So the right dose, right? But there's a certain volume. And then to keep that muscle uh, is less. You actually need less work to keep what it took to build. This is a fact across the board. In fact, some studies show as much as, or as little, I should say, as one-ninth the total volume. So if you did nine sets for chest during the week, one set would keep what you built with nine sets. Now, um, in my experience, I think it's probably more like one fourth or one fifth, but nonetheless, still a big difference. Yeah, uh, it requires a lot less to keep what you got. So, and I hope that brings some people some calm. Um, you, you just you don't need to do as much as you did to get where you got. You just you just got to do something. Um, and you know, we'll talk about that. I've, I've seen up to one seventh. I haven't seen one ninth before. I've seen up to one seventh before, but still, what do you, yeah, I know that, which is crazy. I remember when the first time that I came across that, it really opened my eyes on like how, how little I do need to do mm -hmm. to just maintain that. And also, uh, change the way I kind of looked at stuff. I used to be very all or nothing, right? If I wasn't hammering the weights and, and dieting, it was just like, oh, what's it all for? Why should I do it at all? When I remember reading this and realizing, oh, wow, even if I went to the gym and just did one exercise, you know, this is going to help There's maintain value. the work that I've put in in the previous, say, months or years. Now, to this point, what, what how much of a factor do you think um, how long you've been lifting consistently for plays a role? I, I got I to gotta think that if you just started lifting weights and you've trained consistently, say for six months to a year, and then all of a sudden you reduce down to, you know, a guy, let's say someone who's training six days a week, uh, body part split type of a routine, uh, built some good muscle, made some good traction. And then you switch to a one day a week, full body routine. Uh, and that's it. Um, that comparing that person to say somebody like us been training our whole life, 20 something plus years, and same scenario, let's say I did a body part split most of my life, and then all of a sudden I'd change to a one-day full body routine. I feel like I would have the advantage because of all the years of doing that, and I find that, at least this has been my experience as I've gotten older, that the one advantage of getting older is that it's more years I've been consistently lifting for, and therefore I feel like I can do less to maintain as much. I mean, do you know? What yeah, so... Um there's a few factors I would say that probably play into that. One, the data is is clear, I guess, across the board. So wherever you are and whatever you're doing to get where you are, doing less than that um, will probably will maintain it. Okay, so that's that's true across the board. However, there's some interesting things that happen when you, especially when you strength train for years and years and years. Um, and most, I, I would say, strength coaches and scientists would would say that it probably is due to muscle fiber hyperplasia. So when your muscles grow, the, the it's called hypertrophy. The muscle fiber itself grows. But then there's a phenomenon. We've observed this in animals, and we've done studies on human that, that I, I would say confirm this, that not only do muscle fibers grow, but over time, you actually, those one muscle fiber can become two muscle fibers. Right, it splits, right? Isn't that what yeah. the, the theory? <clears throat> yeah, so you'd get yeah. more muscle fibers. Yeah. Now, why is that? you know, any different than hypertrophy. Well, when you, when you lose muscle, that's when muscle fibers shrink. However, when you multiply or build muscle fibers, they don't go away. So you can shrink muscle fibers, but if you add muscle fibers through hyperplasia, they don't go away. Mm -hmm. So it's like more, it's more permanent 
muscle gain. Which is the same thing that happens with right. fat, right? Also, fat is we the cell the cells just shrink. Yeah, they don't they don't go away. No, which is why it's so important too. Like, and we've learned too that you could actually add fat cells in the in the past. We thought they just grew and then they, they shrank. And, yeah. and we've learned from yeah. you know the extreme yo-yo dieting of crash dieting and then putting on a bunch of weight. There's potential to increase the amount of fat cells. Right. Yeah, and so body. there's the positive side of that, which is the hyperplasia yeah. side that you're talking about where you could potentially add more. So you that's what you would attribute that to. So I, I probably would. have over those two plus decades added of training. Just more, you probably have yeah. more muscle fibers in your biceps now than you did, uh, you know, 20 15 years, years ago, 20 years ago. I'm sure that's a factor. I'm sure too, just like the overall understanding of your body and like yeah. the skill that you've acquired in terms of how to tighten um, certain screws just just so, and, and you're going to get your body to respond. Like if you're an avid lifter and you've been doing it for decades and, and you understand like how to manipulate, you know, your physique and be able to move the needle nutritionally, you know, training wise and it doesn't really like once you get to a certain level. I feel like it doesn't take quite as much uh, if you can dial it all in together. Yeah. That's a really good point, Joe, because it it does seem pretty dramatic for me. Like I feel like the reason mm -hmm. why I'm keep going back to this is that man, it's a it's a big difference for me. Like I feel like the worst shape that I allow myself to get in is in, in my late thirties, forties is still better than the best shape I mm -hmm. could get into in my early twenties, yeah. which is crazy because I know the work. And discipline that I was putting yeah, yeah, towards way harder back then. Yeah, yeah, towards the weights and dieting in my early twenties. Now, to your point, there's probably uh, hyperplasia that is working to my benefit. And then to Justin's point, you're right. Um, just from decades of training, you know, I've, what to do. I've really honed in on the things that really move the needle. Like no, and we've talked on the show before mm -hmm. the importance. Like for me, protein has been such a huge factor with me being able to maintain muscle really close really easily i can quickly become the guy who eats sugary foods high carbohydrates ignore getting enough protein intake and that paired with reducing volume of training or eliminating training just yeah. is just muscle falls off yeah well yeah, yeah and, and that's actually one of the points that we'll get to Today's giveaway is MAPS Strong. If you want to win that program, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you have the best comment, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we got a sale going this, this month on some programs and program bundles. The first program that's on sale is MAPS Cardio. The program bundles that are on sale are the Shredded Summer Bundle and the Bikini Bundle. All of those, 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. You know, what's interesting too about this topic is that fitness fanatics oftentimes are training too much to begin with. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between optimal amount of exercise or strength training, which optimal means this is the perfect amount for your body at this time in the context of your life that is going to build the most strength and the most muscle, make you feel the best. Okay, so that's optimal. But then there's the most you can tolerate. And then there's beyond that, which is overtraining, right? The most you can tolerate is more than what is optimal. Now, what do you sacrifice with, with, with that? You actually sacrifice some gains. There's a perfect amount, and then there's more than that that I can handle. So I can handle more and I'm working out more, but I'm actually getting less results because it's putting too much more of a demand or more of a demand on my body in terms of recovery and it makes the adaptation process harder. So there's optimal and then what you can tolerate. And if you've been working out a long time, what tends to happen through you know months and years of exercise is you start to slowly trend and move towards what you can tolerate. It's just natural. You work out, you've been doing it for a while. Oh, let me add more. This is fun. Wow, let me add more. Oh, I think I can handle this. Let me do more. And you move away from optimal and you move much closer to just the most you could tolerate. So you actually sacrifice some gains. So what ends up happening a lot of times with fitness fanatics is they scale their training back because they're forced to, and then they get gains. They get better gains. This happens to me all the time. Yep. I remember the first time this happened to me, I went on vacation, and I was there was supposed to be a gym available where I went. They didn't have a gym, and so I couldn't work out, and it was like two weeks. So two weeks, no exercise. Then I went back, started working out stronger. And I remember thinking like, this is weird. Always why am I trips people out? Yeah. Why am I stronger? And I realized, oh, I must've been overtraining mm -hmm. before. And then there's other times when I've done six days a week and had to go down to three days a week and, oh, I hit a new PR. Like, so a lot of people listening right now, um, you're, you may not just keep your gains. You may actually see yourself progressing more 
by reducing uh, the volume and the frequency. Yeah, the end there. game isn't to just keep piling on more and more right. and more volume and exercises, <clears throat> which is not really something that's like promoted um, often and people don't understand that it just seems like <clears> – <throat> adding more of everything was always going to be beneficial. And so, you know, to, to understand that, like, it, there's, there's times where if you can step away from it and you get, and you feel that and you understand that like, wow, my body is stronger from, um, you know, doing less or not doing as much this week. Uh, you got to adjust your training to, to appropriately find that dose. Yeah. Does that ever happen to you guys? Were you, were, when you Still to this day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's why we talk about this so much. Um, is that when you when you love training and you and as we all do i mean it's what there are there's a reason why we're in the space you you tend to you know get in the rhythm and motivated and you know and you you do start chasing the you start looking at your workouts as you're you're trying to do more and get better and lift more and you keep pushing those limits and you tend to flirt with overdoing it than underdoing it now that conversation is different for my client who admittedly hates coming to the gym yeah. and doesn't want like, so it's like, I'm always very careful, like how I communicate this message because you know, there, there's the other, the other portion because I know there's people that are listening like, that's a terrible message because yeah. most people are lazy and yeah. Okay. Most don't people put out the effort. Right. But most people also that are those people don't listen to a fitness podcast. Mm -hmm. People who listen to a fitness podcast tend to be people that are into working out and they want to improve how they work out and they're trying to dial this in and figure out all the hacks and figure out how to do it better well so when we communicate this message i think it's important to this audience that they understand that when you like to work out when you get momentum we tend to overreach and i learned this lesson at least once a year every year yeah. at least once a year i'm in some sort of a zone and getting after it and feeling great and be like your point, a vacation comes up, or maybe I even get, I've even had situations where I get sick. I get sick for four or five days right. and I'm knocked out of the gym. And then, you know, you're not even, you weren't, you know, you weren't feeling terrible. You're barely feeling better. You're back in there. And then I'm stronger. Like that doesn't and make you look better. Yeah, like, oh, that's where you like, it really opens your eyes. It's just like, wait a second. Yeah. I know my body should not be feeling amazing right now because yeah. I just got sick for four or five days and I'm back in the gym. I missed my routine. And then I come back stronger. That's always very glaring to me that, oh, wow, I had been overreaching. Yeah, and, and even to take it to a more extreme level, um, for advanced uh, lifters, taking time completely off oftentimes uh, is a way to get your body to progress. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they've done studies on deload weeks, and a deload week is really a week that you go to the gym and you barely work out or don't even work out at all. You can even consider an all week off a deload week. And studies show that people progress faster by including those. In fact, one of our latest programs, Maps Anabolic Advanced, we programmed in uh, deload weeks, and people are saying that they're getting great results just from doing that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and it's easy, it's hard to build muscle. It, losing it takes a little while. It's not like losing stamina. Like if you run four days a week, and then this week, you know, last week, and then this week you ran none, you'll lose stamina pretty quick. Strength sticks around for a little while. It does. Of all the adaptations, strength sticks around, uh, I would say, the longest. So that's working for you. Now, the reason why I'm saying all this is to kind of calm people down because the biggest enemy um, in, in, the, in regards to this particular topic is the fear. Uh, yeah. Is the, the over, fear. Overcorrecting and stuff. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, no, I'm not going to work out. I'm going to lose everything type of deal. It's like, no, the data is very clear on this. Even if you did nothing for a couple weeks, you're not going to lose anything at all. If, and, and oftentimes you'll come back and feel much better. But let's talk about you know, people have been working out for a while. They work out a lot. Something's happening in their life. Maybe they're about to have a kid or change of jobs or something. And they're like, okay, I know I'm not going to be able to work out as much as I always have. Um, how can I really keep progressing or maintain, you know, what I've built? So we've got some tips here that'll help you do that. The first one is to change the phase of training that you're in. Okay. So a phase would be like a rep range or a rest period or even uh, like a, tar a goal, like a mobility phase or a strength phase or like a, a pumping phase type of deal. Changing the phase sends a new stimulus to the body. It's novel. And that usually gets the body to progress. Well, if you reduce volume but then change the stimulus, even if before you were doing the right amount of volume, that change in stimulus is often enough to offset the reduced volume. So changing phases is something I always had people do when they would have to cut back on their volume in a substantial way. And again, this often would contribute to better, better results. 
Yeah, and a lot of times people think that this has to be like um, like a real intense thing. And I'll give you an example of like how I recently have changed a phase up, and I had part of this I was forced into this because of an injury, and that was, you know, I had been gaining great momentum, heavy deadlifting, heavy squatting. Now I'm kind of like recovering and I'm easing my way back in. And I'm like, God, I don't want to same mind pro thought is like, I don't want to lose all these gains. Yeah. I work so hard to get so strong. And, but yet then I also know better. I don't want to go right back to squatting three plus plates and, and potentially injure myself again. So, you know, the thing that came for me was like, well, you know, when was the last time I did a lot of unilateral leg work and stability stuff? Mm -hmm. And so here I am doing, you know, light single leg deadlift type of movements, walking lunges with a, you know, balance component in it, multi cossack squats, which I never really do with some stability involved in it. Like, so, I, and man, my legs mm -hmm. are so sore as if I squatted three, 400 pounds because it was so novel to my body. And so that is a way of progressively overloading. People always think that in order to either get gains or continue to grow and build muscle, we have to keep adding more load. And there's other ways to change up the way you're stimulating that muscle to continue to build muscle. And so I know based off of how I feel afterwards, like, oh, I definitely sent a signal to my mm -hmm. body to build muscle because I'm sore from that and it was and I didn't have to load. Yeah, right. I always look at it like kind of like this pie chart and I know uh, NCI has kind of created something with like the longevity and the aesthetic and the performance focus. But for me, it's like uh, what I what I haven't touched in a while. And so if I'm doing a big strength phase for a long time and I'm just working on low reps, you know, I need to move more into the high reps. You know, if I'm trying to go more hypertrophy, if I want to, if I haven't done anything with endurance and stamina, you know, and it's been a long time, like, okay, like to shake it up and get my body to respond completely differently, let's go into that and let's do that for like three or four weeks, uh, you know, mobility. So there's, there's different there's different pursuits that uh, if you just like change the rep ranges, the tempo, like a lot of these sort of uh, acute variables, it's going to get the body to get sort of that, that stimulus. It's like, oh, wow. It's almost like when you first started uh, your training program in the beginning. Yeah. Now the next one, this one is one everybody tends to do. So I'm going to caution people because you can overdo this as well. But if you do it right, it's actually quite effective. And that's to increase the intensity of your workout. So if you were doing... 15 sets in a workout, now you're doing five. Well, if you did those five harder, theoretically, uh, you should be able to get the same kind of results. This is true to an extent. You can overdo the intensity, though, to the point where the lower volume now doesn't matter. And you're, actually, you're still overtraining, so I've seen people do this. But if you're smart, um, increasing the intensity and doing less can actually be quite phenomenal. So we'll use the example of like stopping your sets short of failure, let's say two or three sets, versus going to failure. Uh, in my experience and some studies will we'll show some of this, it's about one third the volume when you go to failure to get the same kind of results. Okay. So if you were doing nine sets, you could do three sets or maybe even two sets, but instead of stopping two reps short of failure, you go to failure mm -hmm. and those two or three sets will give you, you know, similar uh, type of results. So increasing the intensity is one way. That's one variable you can tweak. So you bring the other ones down, increase the, the, the intensity uh, volume and or or uh, you know intensity meter and that can offset quite a bit the reduced volume. Well, there's there's also people again. This this is perfect follow up to the the original one because it, it's right in line with the advice I gave for the change in the phase. This also was a way of increasing intensity without necessarily adding more reps and more load. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was I was sweating. It was an intense workout because I it was so unfamiliar. I hadn't done that in a long time. So and tr it, trust me, it was frustrating. There was a part of me that actually wanted to not do it because I was so bad at it because it had been so long since I had done single leg deadlifts mm. and I was I kept I'd do a rep or two and then I'd have to put my foot down again yeah. I had to do it and I was getting I always know when I'm like shaky yes you know it's a weird I was I was, I was shaking my glutes were firing like crazy I'm sweating by rep or by set two and I'm going like and I'm frustrated because I wasn't even doing very heavy weight easily you know I want to default bail and go do something that I'm good at but this is a way to increase, not only change the phase, so it's a different type of a phase type training that I'm doing. It's also increasing the intensity mm -hmm. without adding a bunch of reps or load all the time. So there's other ways to make a workout more intense without always the, and by the way, my goal is to have big legs so that it's not like 
I'm going away from my goal. That goal is still to maintain as much muscle on my legs as possible. Yeah, you can even just do this. Like, let's say the the main reason why you need to reduce your volume is because you need to work out less in terms of time. Because that's usually what it is, right? right? It's a time issue. Yeah. Well, if you were resting three minutes in between sets, yeah, you know, a 45 rest. second rest. Mm -hmm. Now you've increased the intensity and you've also cut the time uh, of your workout. You don't even have to cut the amount of exercises. You will have to lower the weight, but because you're resting less between sets, um, you've increased the intensity as a result. Yeah, short, punchy workouts. I remember when that, that hit study came out and then this was like everybody oh, yeah. just jumped on it and that's yeah. all they did and promoted forever. But yeah, there's lots of different ways to do that. So yeah, you cut the rest. You can just like hold more isometric poses with weights, without weights, and just uh, really work on, um, you know, intensifying and tensing up your muscles. Totally. Now this next one is my favorite one. This is the one that I tend to go to whenever I need to do this. And that is to eliminate, quote, less worthy exercises. Okay, so what are less worthy exercises? Well, these are exercises that are not deadlifts, squats, presses, both overhead and horizontal presses, rows, pull-ups, dips, like those big, you know, lunges, those big kind of gross motor movements. Those are the worthy exercises. All the other stuff is less worthy. Now there's value in all of them, uh, but uh, they're not as valuable as the, as the ones that I just mentioned. So to give an example of what this would look like, let's say today was a chest day and I was going to do bench press uh, and cable fly and incline fly, let's say, for example. Let's say I was going to do three sets each, so that's nine sets. Well, I would cut off the fly exercises, and then I'd add a set to my bench press. So now I'm doing four sets of bench press, but I'm still not doing nine sets. That one extra set of bench press oftentimes makes up for all those other sets of those fly exercises. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what happens, they get stronger at this really fundamental lift, right? A squat, you can do this with squats or deadlifts or overhead presses as well. Yeah, stick with those compound lists. It's funny. I immediately think of like Wayne and Garth when they're like, we're not worthy. Like, <laughs> you know, these exercises, but- You uh, yeah. aged yourself. Yeah. I did. I did. And uh, hopefully they put a clip of that. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're, we're not stuck. Not. We're stuck. But, um, yeah, it's- it's those those exercises too that are, that just are like single joint typically, and um, you know, and I'm trying to kind of like get a good uh, muscle pump for a very specific muscle uh, to incorporate uh, those exercises that will will bring a louder signal to the body. Let's just focus on that for a while. Yeah, you're cutting out the fat. I mean, this is Maps 15 to me. Mm -hmm. This is this is totally. the, the beauty of that program. And um, one of the things that I I was really fascinated with, even running it myself, was realizing like, wow, like how I actually made gains, you know, switching from kind of a traditional routine over to math 15. And I think that's why I think what ended up happening, what, and cause I, there's a lot of single joint exercises that I enjoy and I like, and I was starting to put too much energy and prioritizing those too much that it was starting to take away from the ones that were the bigger bang for your buck, yep. eliminating those completely conserved all that extra energy and resources that I was allocating towards those single joint movements, put it all into one or two really important big mm -hmm. bang for your buck movements, and I got more out of it. And so I can't stress this one enough. I think this is one of the biggest mistakes like young uh, men and women make going to the gym is uh, they get caught up in all the whatever the you know, most viral TikTok or Instagram person showing creative, you know, they're mm -hmm. using machines all weird. And you know, saw a kid yesterday in the gym mm -hmm. doing the sideways, you know, pec deck thing. And it's just like, dude, and he's on there doing like five sets of that. And just like, man, one more incline bench press <laughs> would it, would set it done better than that. Well, we're is going to build your chat. And I know that the, the, the kid is thinking, cause he got it from some, probably some, you know, Joey Swole, YouTube, TikTok kid who's telling him, oh, this is how you work that inner chest, you know? And so they're wanting to develop their inner chest when it's like, man, you will develop your chest, including your inner chest and the rest of your chest more, adding another set to your incline bench press and getting real than you will for that. I wish somebody would have spit that game to me when I was that young because I was the same kid who did that type of stuff, saw these unique mm -hmm. exercises and was always chasing something different or novel versus more effective. And I think that this point speaks to that of like, man, just keep, cut the fat out, get to the, get to the things that really move the needle. And even just doing one or two of those movements a day, you'd be surprised how, how killer of a physique you can build just from that. Absolutely. Now the next point you actually mentioned earlier, Adam, which is to keep your protein intake high. You know, what's interesting about this one. 
So here we're talking about healthy, fit people who are working out and then they cut their volume and they want to keep their gains, maybe even progress a little bit. So keep protein high. You know, what's interesting is that there's data on protein intake and people healing from traumatic injury, from getting burned, uh, people who are healing from surgery, people who come back from injury. All of them show that a high protein diet accelerates all those. Mm. So if you're healing from something, um, like a like a cut or bruising or burn or injury, keeping protein intake high helps that as well. Now, why? Protein is the building block of your tissues, mm -hmm. all of your tissues. Your body uses protein to build things up. And now there's a there's a limit to that. Uh, it's about you know it's close to a gram of protein per pound of body weight for most average weight individuals. So beyond that, it doesn't make a difference. But if you keep it up at that point and you reduce your volume, even if you went from perfect volume to less perfect volume, that high protein is more likely to preserve your muscle mass than lower protein. So one mistake that a lot of people make, and this is what Adam was talking about, is they'll cut the volume of their training and they'll simultaneously cut their protein intake because people tend to connect protein with strength training. It's mm. so, like, well, I'm not working out as much, so I'm not thinking about eating protein as much. Don't do that. It's a big mistake. You reduce your volume, keep the protein where it was, you're more likely to maintain the gains that you made uh, working out in the first place. I know there's some people that this doesn't really affect. I, I definitely think there is, uh, obviously, it's unique to each individual. Um, if you just, just have a greater propensity to avoid um, high-protein foods and gravitate more towards. And so if you know that, like, I'm definitely a starchy, carb, sugary type of eater. That's how I was my entire life. It took a long time for me to discipline myself to look at a, a, a meal and always attack mm -hmm. like high protein first. So if you're that person, I think this advice is even more important. I think it's important for everybody uh, for the points that you're making, but I really think it's important if you know that about yourself, if you have the behaviors of snacking on crackers and chips and carbohydrates is what you gravitate towards. More than likely, when you do that, you fill up on those calories, you don't get enough protein. If you're not getting enough protein to even sustain the muscle on your body and you're, in, in addition, reducing volume and cutting back training, oh, you're going to lose muscle. Yeah. So one of the best ways that you can keep that from happening or at least slow that process down, and there's plenty of research and studies that show this, is by keeping that protein intake high. This has been probably one of the biggest differences that I've made as I've gotten older is knowing that, hey, even when I'm being inconsistent is to make sure that I'm still targeting that protein so that there's not this huge fall off when I'm being inconsistent yeah. with my training. And again, a lot of people, I have to reiterate this, a lot of people connect their protein intake to the strength training. <laughs> So let's say you work out and you always have a protein shake after your workout, 50 grams of protein, but now you're working out less. You're now taking 50 grams of protein less a day because mm -hmm. you're not working out. So why would I have this protein shake? You got to eat the same amount of protein you're eating before uh, in order to help you keep those gains. Don't drop your protein because you dropped your training and pay attention. You got to pay attention because this is a sneaky one. Like I said, people tend to, especially fitness conscious people tend to eat more protein when they're working out and less protein when they're not working out. So pay attention to that. Lastly, you can use an advanced technique known as blood flow restrictive training or BFR training on your off days. And what's cool about this is on those days you're not at the gym, you know you're training with less volume. You can literally do three sets of a body weight exercise on your limbs, arms, and legs with blood flow restrictive type techniques. And super it's super lightweight too. Very or body weight, right? Yeah, it, body it, weight or super lightweight. It it simulates lifting heavy weight. That's what's so cool about this. Yeah. So studies on this are, are exceptional, phenomenal. Um, it's great for rehab, but also great to help you keep muscle. So, okay, I'm only working out twice a week right now. Well, on the off days, I can do five minutes of BFR on my arms and legs. And there's also this kind of radiant effect on other muscle groups as well. Um, but at least arms and legs, and um, you're gonna you're gonna keep your, you're more likely to keep your muscle by doing that. Well, this is the reason why this is great for recovery. So we've we've known this in the professional sport world for quite some time now. I believe that's I think it was uh, hockey players where this became were the first ones. Yeah. Where those were the first ones right. to really apply this and it become popular. Now across the board, there's not a professional athlete that rehabs 
and does not utilize BFR for Everybody this reason. Does. And so it's a great way to be able to, you know, uh, stimulate the muscle without loading. I mean, I'm using this right now. This last two weeks. Oh, because you have your injury, right? Yeah, because of the injury. Again, I can't load. So, you know, talking about stability stuff that I'm doing, a lot of multi-planar type things, challenging myself that way. And then also BFR have been the things that I've been doing because I can. And by the, that's why this topic is really cool right now is because, like, my number one thought process right now is that I can train the whole rest of my body normal right now, except for my legs because of this injury. And what I don't want to happen is I don't want to lose all the gains that I've had on, on my legs. And so I'm utilizing everything we're talking about right now. So everything we're talking about right now, I'm having to apply just to my legs because I can't train them the same way that I'm training mm -hmm. the rest of my body. And I want to create this complete lopsided thing where my upper body is super jacked and fit. And then my legs dwindle away because of this injury. So I'm utilizing these techniques, BFR. I've used it twice twice in the last week for this exact reason. Yeah, right you know, and by, for people who don't know, so BFR, blood flow restricted training, you you essentially, if I were going to do it on my arms, I would use a knee wrap. That's probably the best thing to use. And I would tie it around my upper arm just tight enough to where I could feel like it's building some pressure in my arm. You don't want it so tight that you, you don't want you to lose. cut off circulation. Completely. No, you have YouTube but you, videos. On but you want too, we have videos on, we'll, we'll link them here, but it, it creates some pressure. And then what I do is I do some curls. Let's say, let's say normally I do curls with 30 pound dumbbells. I'll grab a 10 pound dumbbell, do some curls. And what it does is it, is it, is it prevents or restricts the blood, the venous outflow. So blood will go in. It's not going to come out like it used to. Right. Waste builds up in the muscle. The burn gets crazy very quickly. Intense pump. And it simulates, it simulates lifting heavy weights. It fatigues and burns out uh, your, your fast twitch muscle fibers as if you were lifting heavy, except you're not. You're lifting very light and you're using almost no equipment. So that's what makes it so awesome. That's why people love it for rehab because you hurt your knee. I can't squat 300 pounds, but I can squat my body weight here, BFR. Your quads and hams don't know the difference. Basically. And you've seen um, lots of products out there like the electric stim, and that always comes back into favor. Like yeah. and putting people putting them on their abs, trying to think that just by uh, passively <laughs> like getting shocked, it's going to, uh, you know, maintain or keep their gains uh muscle wise this is way better technique uh in terms of like actually stimulating that that muscle response yeah 100%. way better and we have we have youtube videos of us showing how to do it and then we also have a bfr guide where we teach people how to implement it into their routine also excellent so there you have it if you are going to take some time off or work out less or you're a friend that's going to do so share this video also if you want some more free information from us Go to mindpumpfree.com. That's where we have all of our free fitness guides. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. Adam.